Hello, I'm Norm Rasmussen. What a privilege it is to bring another testimony into the uh, viewing audience. You're going to be listening to a special brother by the name of Lance Trudell. Lance uh, had a out-of-body experience. He clinically died while uh, suffering from a near-fatal car accident. And uh, he uh, experienced a dimension of heaven. And he feels God wants him to share his experience with the whole world. And so God has brought us together, and we are privileged to put the camera on Lance and let him share. I want to say that um, <clears throat> he should have died. All the doctors said he should have died. His face uh, was crushed. His skull had severe trauma to the car accident he was in. Uh, his body, body got broken up, bones broken. A lot of things happened. But it took him uh, years, uh, literally, to rehab and to be able to speak again, walk, talk. And um, you're going to see that he's not back 100%. He, he correlates well when you speak to him. He knows what you're saying. But he has a hard time of putting his thoughts with his words so they're understandable. comes across as though maybe he's been... Uh, taking drugs or drunk or however people would perceive it, that's not so. He's just a little bit slower than what most people are used to. So bear with that. Um, he's got a message from God, and somebody needs to hear that who's going to be watching this. So with that, let's turn this over to Lance and see what God is going to do. Uh, hi, I'm Lance Trudell, and right off I just want you to listen it's very important and I want to tell you that I've had an experience of heaven and it's real and it's, it's no joke and it's very important that you listen to me because possibly somebody that you know may have had the same kind of experience or someone that's actually listening and watching this Program might have experienced the same thing and are afraid to share it, which is very important. It's important to share things like this. That's basically why I'm doing it, because I feel a need to share this. Um, I want to start right out and tell you that in 1998, September 27th, I had a fatal car accident and it was fatal because my spirit was in heaven in front of God and when that happened God had purged me and he had he purged me, purified me, God had purified me and then he sent me to heaven. I wasn't in heaven, I was at heaven. There is a heaven, I've been there. I wasn't in heaven, I was at heaven. And it was paradise, it was overwhelming joy. I felt, my whole spirit felt overwhelming joy, peace, and love. I felt this very powerful feeling. And when I was there, I saw God. God looked like the sun. And he was, he, he was, he, I've got a few things written down and I want to read them. Things that I have had on my mind that I, writ, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget. And uh, the, the pleasing radiance of God, his love, joy, and peace is like, being next to a fire on a cold night. I felt the I felt the radiance of God, but I felt the power like I didn't feel it on my back. I felt it but I didn't feel the power of the radiance of God on the front side of me and not on the back side of me. You will regret not being godly. In your soul, you'll be in overwhelming joy if you know Jesus 
Jesus Christ is your only way. Jesus Christ. I didn't see Jesus. I just feel that that's the only reason I even came close to God and felt God is because I know Jesus and I've always had a relationship with him. I haven't always followed godly things to do. I've always been tempted and trialed from Satan, but I always knew Jesus, and he is why I went to heaven in my death experience. Um, oh, by the way, I wanted to tell you that there is no death. When I died, boom, right away, I was in front of God. As soon as I died, as soon as I died, I was in front of God. I was alive in front of God. I didn't feel dead. I didn't feel the, the pain of my car crash. I didn't remember nothing bad about it. I just remember being alive in front of God right away. That's one thing that I remember uh, because when I had the experience of being in front of God, I, uh, I, I felt like, I felt like joy, overwhelming joy, and just, it just over, overflowed. God is so powerful that he, he he just his aura is so strong it's just no earthly words could explain and that's why I wanted you to listen so you can know that there is a heaven and God is very 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 strong powerful and loving and peace and joy filled I, to me, the feeling that I got at the time will be, will last forever. That's paradise. That is paradise. That is awesome. I mean, to think that I'm going to feel that way for a reward from this life so that I'm going to feel that good forever, for eternity. And that is, I can't even put that in words. It's, it's outstanding. It's phenomenal. And I'm actually going to feel that high. I'm going to feel that high. And that's without no drugs. No drinking, no drugs. It's going to, I'm going to feel high. I'm going to feel higher than I've ever felt, and believe me, I've used and abused every drug and alcohol there is to use and abuse, and I've never experienced the high that I've experienced when I died. I want to tell you, I was born, I was abused mentally, physically, and emotionally when I was very young, when I was like six or seven or eight. And uh, I accepted Jesus when I was five. And I had a very Christian grandmother. And I began partying with drugs, alcohol and other drugs. Um when I was very young. I quit school because I partied and sold in my younger years and I sold. My younger years were wasted. I fell in love. When I got older, I fell in love. I got married. I had a baby boy. Then I got divorced. My best friend died. I did lots of drugs. I got robbed. 
drugs, got robbed. I was at work. I owed money for the... I owed money for the drugs that I had. I was selling. I was fronted. And I owed money to the wrong people. And... uh, I robbed the bank. I robbed the bank because I didn't want to rob from anybody's pocket. I didn't want to rob a store or, uh, you know, some kind of business. I wanted to rob from a bank because the a bank was is federally uh, secured, and I figured it would be better to rob from a bank because it wouldn't be affecting someone so personally. I went to prison. Uh, I lost another love that I had at the time. She was a a fiancé. Another one of my best friends died. And I did and sold lots of drugs while I was incarcerated. Made big money. I was in a bad car accident and uh, I died. And uh, I died in 98, September 27th, 1998. And uh, after going through years of therapy, I'm still, I have a psychologist, and I'm still involved in Hope Network. Um, My uh, son was murdered. My son that I, he was a daddy's boy. He, He was everything to me. He was big and beautiful and awesome. To me, he was everything. And uh, that's another thing that that I really went through a lot of pain when I went to prison. Because, uh, oh, by the way, I had turned myself in for the rob in that bank. After I had paid my debt, I had turned myself in. And uh, possibly I did that to less, less, least lessen the punishment. It didn't. I did, did uh, 62 months incarcerated. Especially because this life is just a scratch of what eternity is. We'll be alive forever. And either you go to heaven or you go to hell. And I've never been to hell. I've I've heard experiences. I can't talk about it because I don't know. I have no idea. I just know that there is a heaven, an actual heaven. There is an actual place where it's overwhelmed with joy, love, and peace. And it'll be, I, I can't wait. I am not afraid to die. I would die for any one of you watching this. I would die for you. You know, it's because I love you and more because I know what it's like. There is no death. Death is just an escape from this world, which I actually love. But I know killing myself wouldn't be the way to go because you wouldn't get your joy. If you just listen to what I have to say and believe what I have to say, and that's about all I got to say, thanks. Well, I'm gonna be asking Lance uh, a number of questions to try to get the most out of him about this uh, experience he had and and, uh, I have some other questions for him, but uh, just to quickly refresh, um, he was uh, driving his uh, vehicle. He, they told him later, after all said and done, that a 
tie rod uh, had uh, come loose or broken in his car that uh, it swerved over and hit somebody head on. Is that right, Lance? Yeah, I collided with a truck pulling a boat. Okay. And uh, at that point in time, uh, he died clinically. And uh, share a little bit about that. Well, I I was uh, 16 minutes away from the heliport, the helicopter, the ambulance, um, and uh, they took 16 minutes to get to me. And as far as I'm concerned, I was dead the whole time because I remember being in heaven, not in heaven, at heaven for a long time. I don't know how long I was there actually. I just know that I, because of my revelation, I was in front of God immediately. And uh, after... Well, you, you were in front... Okay, let me, let me back up, because as I understood this, you weren't in front of God, you were at the edge of heaven, but somehow you could see God's face shining like the sun? No. No, no, I got that wrong. I didn't see God's face. All I saw was it looked to me like the sun, just the big, powerful spot of sun. That's what, and God happened to be on top of a mountain that uh, I saw from the heaven that I was at. I saw God was on a mountain, an unclimbable mountain. It was a mountain that goes straight up for a long ways. I don't know if that's Mount Zion in the Bible or not. I just know that I was in heaven. I was near God, and he was on a mountain, and he was on top of a mountain, and he was, he looked like very powerful. He looked like all power, power. That's what it looked like. Well, I felt like royalty. I felt like royalty. You felt like royalty at first? I felt like royalty. That's what I felt like. I mean, that's the overwhelming feeling that I got. I felt like royalty. I felt peace and love and joy. I felt so much. I, f I felt it was my it was my reward, but it was like my reward for all that sin. That's where I felt unworthy, because I felt like all this sin that I lived, all this trash that I lived, and you made me feel like that. That's where I felt unworthy. But I felt like royalty. I felt a I just like royalty. I felt above myself. I felt like royalty. Wow. And uh, so, did God talk to you? I'm sure He did, but I don't. I was never able to remember that. I'm, I know He did, but I just I know He did because He purged me. The way he purged me, you know, I cried so hard. I cried. I bawled. I bawled next to him. And, and that purging. And then he sent me to heaven. Not in heaven, at heaven. He sent me. He, he, he allowed me to live this so I could express and tell my, my experience to other people. So you don't have any idea how long this was going on in earth time no I really don't but I know that I was there for a long time you know minutes 15 minutes 16 minutes that's what I figure because I had plastic surgery three times on my face and it, that's why you can't even tell you can't even tell and uh, I've got stainless steel in my or not stainless steel, but uh, titanium uh, eye socket and part of my cheekbone. What else happened to your body? Uh, uh, why did you get broken up? Oh, um, I busted some ribs, 
and my back, three of four of my vertebrae in my back are now pressed against my spine, pressed against the cartilage that is next to my spine, and that is very painful, but an experience that I have to deal with. And uh, actually, through prayer and uh, meditation, that is, uh, God has, Jesus has removed a lot of the pain and made it, made it so I can work. And I love my job. Well, uh, what, okay, so, and then what happened to your skull? What all happened to you that you know of? Well, Obviously, it did some brain trauma. Yeah. You couldn't speak. Actually, actually um, this part of my eye socket was shattered, and uh, part of my cheekbone was shattered, and that caused part of my brain to almost come out. In the swelling, it came out, and it... Uh, you know, it just, it was, you know, as far as anything else, I don't know if anything else, oh, my neck, it bothered my neck, it messed up my neck a little bit, but uh, I don't know of anything else other than it broke, you know, all, most of my fingers were broke, and uh, my knee was broke, both my knees actually, but one of my knees is actually, I've had a lot of problems, but through prayer and uh, going to church, going to the prayer line, I've had a lot of pain relieved. Praise God. And how long were you then in a coma? I was in a coma for a long time. I don't know exactly because I was in a coma, but... I guess it was a long time. Like weeks, some months? Yeah, yeah. Couple, ni 97 days I heard. 97 days they told you. Yeah. Okay, so... So you weren't able, okay, so how did you communicate when you woke up? Well, my, I have a deaf brother, and I learned some sign language and uh, the ABCs, I remember the ABCs. So when I woke up from my comatose, because I, after I woke up from my coma, I was comatose. My eyes were open, but I didn't see anything. I didn't register anything in my brain. But when um, when when I woke up, from my coma, I remember my sister was sitting next to one of my sisters was sitting next to me, um, telling me what happened. You know, she said, Lance, you were in an accident and um, you're in the hospital now and uh, me and your ex-wife and mom have been here, you know, the whole time you've been in a coma and they're we're waiting for you to wake up. I just heard and I started doing sign language with my hand and I think the first thing I said was untie my hand, you know, because my hand was tied down because I kept pulling all the tubes out of my tracheotomy and my feeding tube and everything. I kept pulling it out and uh, I, I was doing sign language, telling telling my sister to un, un, untie my arm. And my, my sister noticed, and my mom was there, and she said, Mom, I think he's doing sign language. And um, when my mom asked me, are you doing sign language, I spelled Y-E-S, you know. And then we started talking. I started communicating like that. How long was
was it before, after re, you started going to rehab, uh, obviously to get your bones back in shape, everything back in shape, how long did it take you to begin to learn how to start talking, roughly? I don't know. It took years. You know, I, I remember speech therapy. I was in speech therapy for many years, you know, 10, 10, 12 years I was in speech therapy. And uh, I still sound intoxicated when I talk, but uh, you know, I'm getting better. I'm getting a lot better. I mean, if you, if you think it's bad now, you should have heard it then. You would, you would not believe it. through obviously God has um, uh, kept you around uh, to to share I'm gonna ask you some about your earlier life but what what is life for you now are, are you are you timid and shy about telling people about heaven and God's real and heaven's real or how, how do you deal with people when you're around people um, about your story the way it is now I really believe that See, I will jump right in to you. If I meet you and we spend a couple minutes together, I'll jump right in, dive right in and say, hey, I had an experience and I want to know, do you know Jesus Christ? And they'll say yes or no. And the chances are they won't want to talk about it. And the chances are that there's sin in their life and they don't want to talk about it because they feel guilty or they feel in a way unworthy but if they should if they if they only knew that that's what Jesus Christ died for our sin and our temptation all our bad from past present and future sin that's what, when God wants us to talk about them. God wants us to, you know, like share experiences because it, it'll it affects people. Even Christians, they they might say yes, they're a Christian, but then they want to talk about something else because they just don't want to talk about it. So you feel responsibility to God to be telling people why Jesus Christ was sent to earth and to die on the cross and pay a penalty for all the past, present, future sins. He took on all of our punishment so that we could be free from punishment when we stand before God and give an account at the judgment day, whenever that is for us. All right. Right? Yeah. That's I... the message of Christianity. That's the, the pure message of Christianity. So, so you're bold in sharing that. I know. Then there's the thing is, is I uh, sit and watch pastors on TV, and uh, the last questions is say things that I have know from asking God for wisdom. The wisdom that God has given me is it. it goes beyond anything I've ever read or seen on TV. It's just wisdom that happens to be in my brain that I can know the answer to. Really? Questions that I know the answer to. Like I say, wisdom that I've asked God to give me and he has. Well, brother, you and I, when we, when I first met you, you, you called and we were talking. I got together and I wanted to see what you were all about and see if you were the real deal or not. Always got to get a witness from the Holy Spirit to see who we're dealing with and what God has to say. So there was a time of getting to know you and we just enjoyed a couple of good hours at, at least about your understanding of joy in heaven. I mean joy, rewards of joy for Christians for being faithful down here during hard times and and it's like i'm gonna i'd like to pull out of you as much as i can get out of you because i've never met anybody who has so much passion about the rewards of joy waiting for christians when they get there for being faithful for witnessing 
though a lot of people don't want to hear about Jesus Christ, they don't want to know about Christianity, they'd rather talk about anything but what God accomplished for us through Jesus Christ, and, but, but you have a sense of knowing that there's going to be so, the, the joy is going to be so overwhelming for all eternity for Christians who's being faithful to stand up for what's right, to walk in righteousness, to stay away from sin, to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with those who haven't heard it, and most of them don't care to hear it, but God wants them to hear it because on the judgment day, um, for those who go to hell, they're not going to be able to tell God, hey, nobody ever told me that Jesus died for my sins. Right. You know, I, all I ever heard was all them Christians want your money. Uh, they want to control you. And uh, that's all I ever heard about Christianity. I never heard that uh, there's going to be uh, rewards of joy. Uh, so I'm probably saying a little too much. Any thoughts come to mind here on, on joy in heaven? Oh, no, I believe that your joy is a reward. I believe your joy is a reward. And I don't know if, if it's a reward for believing in Jesus or all the good that you've done in your life. I believe that the joy you're given is all the things you've done in your life and believing in Jesus. But, um... Well, so you've, you've done drugs. You've done a lot of drugs earlier in your life. Yeah, yeah. Was this having an experience as good as any of those drug highs? Uh... I've used and abused every drug that I've ever ran across, I've ever had a chance to uh, use and abuse. I have overdosed a couple of times, and I have never been as high as I was when I died, when I felt when I died. I, my spirit. I, I I wasn't using drugs at the time. I wasn't intoxicated when my accident happened. It just the feeling that I got once I was dead and was in front. The feeling that I got, I was my whole soul was, or my spirit. My body was on earth, but my spirit was full of joy and I was high on that joy and higher than I've ever been and it's overwhelming to me to actually think that that's what I'm going to feel for eternity for eternity I'm going to feel that overwhelming joy peace and love for eternity it's phenomenal well Let's uh, let's clarify something here. To to this moment, you probably assumed that Lance had this encounter, this supernatural encounter of being in the spirit realm, being uh, outside of heaven. He shares that outside of heaven. He wasn't in heaven, but he was outside of heaven somehow. And he knew the, the greater peace and joy and love from God was inside heaven, but he just was getting a little bit of overflow through it. He didn't see any angels. Uh, he was by himself, he shared with me. And uh, what's now really interesting is that he didn't remember having this experience when he woke up from his coma. It was at a later time that God gave him a supernatural, downloaded him with a supernatural revelation of what had happened to him when he died. But interesting, I think, is that is that how he got that revelation. Now, your boy died. Your, after, after this experience, do you have any idea how long after you come out of the coma, your boy died? Yeah, um... I don't know how long it was after my I came out of a coma, but well, it was ten years. And he was murdered. Yes, my son lived in Florida. Yeah, and I so with that pain of the loss of your boy, you were praying or what? Uh, and 
what happened? Well, 10 years later. 10 years later. Yeah, 10 Many years year, well, then that after was, my accident. So this was actually, so 10 years, at least 10 years after your accident, after you'd come out of the coma, yeah. you had no recollection of a heaven encounter no. for 10 years after your uh, accident. And oh. So you were seeking God, praying, just pouring your heart out to God or crying to God or weeping before God. What about your, your boy being gone? Yeah, my, my uh, son being gone. And uh, I was asking God. I was crying on the floor, on my hands and knees, crying. Uh, two days after my son was murdered, I was uh, sobbing and uh, praying to God, asking him why he let me live and took my son, let me live to experience that. And uh, that's when I got, God had given me a revelation of my death experience. So that's when I knew I had went to heaven, I had died, I had went to heaven and had that experience. And when, when, I, when my revelation was over, I was sitting on my knees I was done crying. I was done crying because I knew then that I was going to see my son again. And uh, that's how I feel right now. I feel like I'm going to see my son again. It's very difficult because he he would have made me a grandpa who, who knows how many times. And I would be the best grandpa there is. You know, it's just, you know, at least I know I will see him again, and I'm really looking forward to seeing my grandmother again and seeing my grandpa, you know. I just, I feel bad for the people that didn't know Jesus. And they're in hell, not in burning hell, I believe. They're just in a godless place waiting for the white throne judgment when they get, go to hell. They think they're in misery now, but when they, they're in real misery is when they get sent to hell from God. Hell is a uh, burning, torturous, painful place to be. I wouldn't even like to experience or imagine it because, you know, it's obvious why. I just know that I feel sorry for anybody who doesn't accept Jesus and doesn't get to heaven. I just feel sorry for them because heaven's a real thing. Well, do you think a person can get to heaven if without Jesus? No, it's impossible. It's, it'd be easier for a person to get through the eye of a kick, eye of a needle a small hand needle than it would f for them to get into heaven. It'd be easier to get through a needle of a, a knee, or an eye of a needle than it would be to get to heaven. It's impossible. I just know that I didn't see Jesus. I just know that that's why I was able to experience heaven because I... I and that's where I was gonna go, and that's as I that's my death, my son. That's why I was able to experience it, and it was also to tell you and everybody about it. And it's just I, I think that's why I'm able to sit here and talk and tell you about it. And actually, th this is why I um, survived. Well, I don't doubt that, uh, brother. You've had a lot of pain. Uh, I know life hasn't been easy for you since you came back. Nobody would want the life you had to live, and you work with a lot of handicaps now many years later, and uh, uh, it's not easy. I know that. We talked a great deal about infirmities, and uh, it's commendable that uh, you keep doing the best you can do with what you got to work with. and. Uh, 
I know you pretty much have shared with me before when we were talking about the only thing you live for is to tell other people um, the goodness of Jesus, uh, who he, you know, who he is, what he's all about, and that uh, there is no other way that God has provided. The Bible's made it perfectly clear there is no other way that we can have our sins forgiven other than by uh, believing that uh, God the Father sent Jesus Christ down to earth, uh, lived a normal life for 33 years. As far as we know, we don't have a lot of information in the Bible about those first uh, 30 years, but uh, he never sinned. The Bible says he never sinned, and that's the reason why, because he didn't sin, he was the only acceptable sacrifice that God the Father would accept to pay full penalty for your sins, my sins, for the sins of every individual. And so he, he, the greatest insult that we could ever uh, launch against God is to say, well, I don't believe that you have to accept Jesus to get to heaven. Well, now, wait a minute. Okay, the creator of all the universe, the one with all power, uh, has clearly said in the New Testament Bible that uh, there is no other way to have your sins forgiven other than accepting and believing and being thankful that God himself uh, paid full penalty for all of your sins by going to the cross and dying a painful death when he didn't have to. He willfully did that for each of us. And uh, so he paid the penalty for all of our sins so that on our judgment day, we will be uh, free uh, and all that will be waiting for us is joy and peace and God's love forevermore and all the other wonderful things that uh, royalty. will be happening. Royalty. We are royalty. We are royalty now because of our position in Jesus Christ. Yeah. We yeah. already are royalty. Yeah. We're heirs of God. It's, co-heirs with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's just hard to uh, fathom that or to b believe in that when, you know, the next neighbor, the next door neighbor shot 12 kids at school or, you know, I mean, the way the world is now, it's just hard to fathom that, that we are royalty. And that's where what I s said before was worthiness. You, you, no matter how awesome you are as a Christian, when you get to heaven, you're going to feel that unworthiness. You're going to get more reward than what you would, you know, you could ever anticipate. Your, your reward is going to be so great. And I didn't see up rewards. I didn't see the crowns of righteousness and all that. I didn't see any of that. I just felt the way I felt. And I, I feel now I feel unworthy. I didn't feel unworthy at the time. I don't think. I don't know when I felt unworthy. I just know that my royalty, I, can't, I couldn't believe it. I was actually, I felt like royalty. Well, uh, God gave him some experience of uh, that royalty, and truly, um, the, the Bible does say in the New Testament that when you're in Christ, when you've made Jesus Christ your personal Lord and Savior, trusting him to be the only way to have your sins forgiven, that God, the judge, uh, determines that they will be forgiven, and... Uh, um, that immediately uh, entitles us to receiving the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. That gets into a teaching here that I'm going to go off on a little tangent and then we're going to come back and ask him some more questions. You see, um, the Bible tells us that as soon as we make Jesus Christ our personal Lord and Savior, uh, his righteousness is imputed to us. It was imputed to us when he died on the cross. Okay, but we're not uh, qualified for that until we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior. When we do that, God immediately imparts to us 
the righteousness of God or the right, his righteousness, his holiness. So we are immediately positionally as holy and righteous as we could ever possibly be. Okay. That's our position in our unity or oneness with Jesus Christ, making him our Lord and Savior. Now, that's just half of the truth, but it's a marvelous truth. That makes us royalty immediately. But we have a hard time getting that revelation. And we say, well, I have sin in my life. I have impure thoughts. I have this and that. Well, because you are already holy positionally, God's saying, begin to live up to it. And that's called the big word of sanctification. And that's what all Christians are going through. They are uh, endeavoring to uh, come to the realization of how much of a sinner they were and that God has forgiven them. And now to get victory over these areas of sin because they will be rewarded for it in eternity. But uh, we can understand that by revelation. He has experienced it in a personal dimension. And uh, so we praise God for that. All right. I've had to change position here, Lance, because I was getting a terrible backache. Uh, this is kind of an unnatural position to try to do an interview, but we're doing the best we can. And um, I guess I'd like to ask you to end out this video uh, taping by praying for people as the Holy Spirit would lead you to pray for people. Uh, would you do that? Yeah, sure I would. Um, I just, I would think that what my testimony and my evidence experience would bring Christians closer to God, closer to what they know is the right thing, and bring them to bring other people who don't know Jesus into knowing Jesus. And that's what I pray for is just so somebody would know Jesus and accept Jesus into their heart you know from my testimony that would be that would be everything to me that would be that's that's all I want I want just one person to know Jesus that doesn't know him now so if at all possible Holy Ghost please help that person that knows Jesus to talk to another person who doesn't know Jesus or have them explain things to them and get them to accept Jesus Christ into their heart and uh, just let it go on let one person to another person just let it go on it, it's, it's very important our rewards are so plentiful and awesome that it's just very important that everybody knows you and lives for you the more Christians the better this world would be amen well I pray that uh, God has uh planted or watered a seed of encouragement for you, uh, I'll tell you, heaven is going to be wonderful. I have a few things that I want to share uh, that dovetails with this broadcast. Um, as you can tell, Lance isn't the most eloquent, eloquent in being able to uh, articulate himself, and I, I'm not the best myself. I can write a whole lot better than I can speak much of the time, but do what you can do. But I, uh, I, I, in talking to Lance, when I first spent several hours with him, finding what he was made of and exactly what he wanted to share on film, he spent a great deal of time talking about when he stood at a distance viewing God and he was feeling that love, that unconditional love and the acceptance that goes with it and the peace and the joy. 
He also talked, and then he mentioned about the royal day. You heard him talk about royal day, but you only heard him say one time about unworthiness. And I, I probably should have interrogated him more, asked him more about that, but I was not feeling good, and it was not a good time for actually for me to be filming. We had a bad microphone cord. I didn't know that till later, and it was, you know, in retrospect, probably should go back and redo it, but... I, I'm going to be looking to do that at a futuristic time because because uh, I think Lance just needs a little bit of structure. He needs some notes to be able to look at, and it'll help him coordinate his thoughts better to share his testimony more fluently where we won't even have to do a uh, question and answer format, but like I normally uh, like to do is just put a camera on somebody and let them speak and trust that the Holy Spirit's going to speak through them. So in time we'll see what God's going to do with that, but we got to work with the footage we've got. And back to the main thought there. It, when he was standing there um, at the edge of heaven viewing the awesomeness of God, he felt so unworthy on one hand, but he felt like royalty on the other. Okay? And he, accentuated, he tried to put into words, not on camera, but when I was speaking with him prior, uh, initially meeting with him and talking with him, getting to know him and you know hear a story, he talked about a great deal this dichotomy or this, this vast difference of feeling unworthy to be in God's presence, feeling unworthy to even be where he was, feeling unworthy to receive the unconditional love and acceptance and the peace and the joy and knowing uh, some revelations about eternal rewards. But here he felt like royalty. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to share with viewers here that this is how all people who make it to heaven, all people who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and have chosen to believe that Jesus Christ was the only one who paid the price, paid the penalty for our sins so that we could have them forgiven by God so that on the judgment day, those sins will not be brought into account, but for Christians, it will be reward day. Okay? That's called the Bema Seat of Christ, and that gets into the different types of judgments, and we won't go there. There's judgments for the saved, there's judgments for the unsaved. Um, and the judgments for the saved is really not judgment, it's reward day. Judgment for the unsaved, the great white throne judgment, that's where they will be sentenced uh, to go to hell for eternity. Okay, And all their sins will be played out and they will be justly uh, punished for them. But for Christians, Jesus took their punishment for them. That's what we're to believe. That's what saves us and that's what keeps us saved. Okay. Whether I grow cold toward God and grow distant and get upset at Him and mad and fall away, and those things are just obscuring the reality of the fact, here's what saves me and here's what keeps me saved. Now, I'm on a tangent, but bear with me because I feel the Holy Spirit wants me to reinforce this. So many Christians are confused, well, did I lose my salvation or was I ever saved? Or, you know, how can I get saved? Will God take me back? God will never stop you from believing that he sent his son, God the Father sent his son, Jesus Christ from heaven, one of the three persons of the Godhead, came down here, lived 33 years on this life, never sinned once, made him the only acceptable sacrifice God the Father would accept to atone or pay ransom payment for the sins of every person, past, present, and future. All of our sins of our lifetime were, were uh, paid for by the substitutionary death that Jesus Christ provided for us so that we could be forgiven of our sins once and for all. Okay? And that's what saves us. And continuing to believe that until we die is what continues to save us. And as long as we believe that and are willing to die for that, I don't care how much people wallow around in sin and get cold toward God and get mad and upset and all that. Sure, God's the judge. He knows who's being honest with him. He knows the heart of each and every one of us. So mouth, so what the words we mouth may not go that far with God, but he knows our heart condition. And so that's off on a tangent. Forgive me for that. But, but so for those of those who make it, those who make it to heaven and are okay with God, 
Here's the point I believe the Holy Spirit wants me to make, and make it as clearly as I can. For all eternity, all eternity, Christians are going to feel this both ends of the spectrum. Okay? They're going to feel unworthy for all that God has for them, yet they're going to feel like royalty. Why is that? Now, I can't prove that from Scripture. I just believe that's a revelation the Holy Spirit has given me, so take that for what it's worth, okay? But I believe there's a good reason for that. That's going to keep us humble. That's going to keep Christians humble for all eternity. You see, the devil and a third of the angels that got kicked out of heaven, that's what they lacked, humility. They lacked humility. And God isn't going to let uh, anybody up there in heaven with him ever again uh, engage in pride as Satan and a third of the angels did, okay, to where basically it's like, well, God, we kind of want to run the show. You let us do it, and we can run it as good as you, as pr and probably better. That basically was, had to be their attitude that they projected to God. God ain't going to have that anymore. It ain't going to happen. Okay? He needs humble people. He needs humble people. And that's how he's going to keep them humble. You're going to know, as a Christian, you didn't deserve to be saved. You didn't deserve to have this joy, this peace, unending joy, unending peace. Rewards of joy, rewards of peace and love, rewards beyond anything that God has even uh, allowed us to comprehend yet, okay? We're going to know we aren't worthy of it. There's nothing we could, did to earn it. None of us deserved what we were getting. What we deserved was eternal punishment in hell. That's what we all deserve. We're going to know that for eternity, I believe. Why? Because God's going to use that as a humbling factor. And this will be the appreciation factor for what he did for us by dying on the cross for us. God dying on the cross for us. Royalty. Okay? Royalty. We are royalty. Heirs with God. Co-heirs with Jesus Christ. Romans 8, chapter 8 of Romans tells us that's what we are, those of us who are in Christ Jesus. So that's what I believe God wants us to get out of this complete video package and at a future time hopefully Lance will be able to share that more in depth with a greater anointing upon him okay and uh, we'll see we'll leave what leave that into God's hands see what happens there uh, again done one last time none of us are worthy to be saved we will know for all eternity we're unworthy so unworthy but it won't be painful it won't be painful it won't be painful it'll just be a humbling factor. That's what it will be. So that with appreciation, that's what's going to make our joy in heaven all that much greater. Greater, Okay? Knowing that we don't deserve it, but he's given it to us anyway. Making us feel like the royalty that he says you are in Christ Jesus. But out of Christ Jesus, he ain't royalty. You're a no-count sinner, okay, that deserves punishment in hell for eternity each and every one of us that's what god says about each and every human being okay and so he says you want to have royalty status now you gotta go through jesus to get it he's the only way when jesus says in scriptures i'm the way the truth and the life no one comes to the Father but through me or by me, depending upon the translation. Now that might give you a little better understanding of why God has said there is no other way. No way that I have provided my created beings to obtain royalty status than through the sacrifice that I provided, the very costly sacrifice. To impart that right to you. Mm. God is so wise. So wise. Thank you, Father, for your wisdom. And uh, thank you for hearing me out. And uh, look forward to uh, an upgraded video of Lance in the future. But uh, leave that in God's hands. Lance could be in heaven tomorrow and this will be the only footage we get. We'll leave that into God's hands. Thank you. And I just want to share other thing, uh, one other thing here before I sign off. Uh, you know, if there's any of you who've had what you believe is an out-of-body experience, a uh, 
uh, well, you know, a vision uh, or an experience of some sort. Maybe you're not sure what it is, but but you were impressed. You were you were into the spirit dimension, and and it was something that would glorify God. It would line up with scriptures. It would be Jesus glorifying somehow, some way. Feel free to let us know about that. Uh, you know, we're always looking to uh, publish testimonies, and that's an area where everybody is attracted to. They want to know about life after death. They want to know about heaven. They want to know about hell. And, uh, you know, if you've had a hell encounter and uh, I got a witness on it, see if we can maybe help give it some extra exposure. So feel free to contact us here at Precious Testimonies. Go to our website, preciousTestimonies.com. There's email and information there, how you can get that to us. And we'll just see what God would do, okay? Uh, again, thanks a lot. Hello, I'm Norm Rasmussen, founder of the Precious Testimonies Outreach Ministry. Is heaven real? Is hell real? Well, most of us want to believe heaven's real. And uh, most of us don't want to believe hell is real. I want to share with you um, a story, a testimony of an individual who had a taste of hell. I know this individual personally. Uh, he's the real deal. And uh, I'll be reading his story of what he experienced in hell shortly. But let me just read first a little bit about heaven. In the New Testament, in the book of Luke, chapter 15, it reads, starting in verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, after I read this brother's testimony, I'm going to explain a little bit about what the Holy Spirit wants us understanding about that particular scripture passage. Why do all of the angels in heaven rejoice and the saints who are already there? Why do they rejoice over one, center, one sinner that repents? And the other 99 that don't repent, there is no joy. We'll get to that, okay? Um, <clears throat> this, uh, this testimony is written, shared by a Reverend Timothy T. LaFond. Tim LaFond, okay? And let's get right to it. These are his words. I want to give my personal testimony on dying and going to hell. I want to share the facts of what happened and how I ended up being cast into outer darkness. Maybe you have not heard of outer darkness. I'm going to tell you about outer darkness before we're done with this video clip. I cried out. I screamed out at the top of my lungs, God help me. That was January 27th, 1977. I'll share a little of my past prior to that happening. The first 27 years of my life, I was raised a Catholic, in a Catholic home and attended 12 years of Catholic schooling. One of my favorite nuns, Sister Maria Elizabeth, told me that none of the other nuns or teachers liked me except her. Well, with that, she said she was always my favorite, and I had a lot of respect for her, uh, but the others meant nothing to me. I graduated in 1968, and that summer I was introduced to marijuana. That escalated into smoking hash, PCP, or also called angel dust at the time, THC, mescaline, and LSD. I loved to drink beer and wine along with the drugs. In 1974, the company I worked for in Ohio went on strike. The strike lasted until early fall. I did my one week's uh, strike duty on the picket line and then drove to my mother's home on the Sheboygan River in Michigan for the remaining strike time. 
One weekend while doing LSD, I started hallucinating and got very paranoid. After partying, I normally would fish uh, the rest of the night at the end of the dock while doing drugs. Well, on this particular night, I couldn't keep focus, so I ended up going into the house and I went to bed. I was scared and afraid that I was losing my mind. I remember, though, asking God to let me keep my mind. The following Friday, my mother said to me, quote, Last Saturday, you were really drunk. I asked her why she would say that. She replied, At about 3.30, I was up, and I went into your room. I was looking at you, and I couldn't tell if you were breathing or not, so I sat down on the side of your bed, and I bent over you to see closer. Suddenly, you grabbed me around the neck and started choking me. I couldn't get away, and the more I fought, the harder you squeezed. I couldn't say anything. You just kept saying, Mom, is that you? Mom, is that you? Finally, you let go of me. I was so out of breath that I passed out right on top of you till I could regain my breath and strength. Praise God my mother lived that night. I unknowingly choked her, and praise God Jesus lives today. Well, you'll understand why he likes to say praise uh, God that Jesus lives today as I continue along here with uh, his story. Here I have to say the words to this blessed old Christian song. If you know Brother Tim, he loves Christian songs. He loves some of the oldies, and some of them mean so much to him. Uh, this is the song, He lives, He lives, Jesus Christ lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. I can't sing. You ask me how He knows. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Okay, I flunked singing classes. Uh, let's move on. Now I know that my family would never have forgiven me if God had not intervened that summer night, nor could I have forgiven myself for that matter. Uh, had I strangled my mother to death while I was under the influence of alcohol and drugs, not even realizing I was doing that. I was the youngest of seven children and considered the black sheep of the family as it was. I thank God for that night was the last time I took mescaline or LSD. To God be the glory. Amen to that. For the next two years I continued to smoke pot. I also got dependent on speed or white crosses as some call them, and little did I know that God was bringing me closer to knowing Him and His glory. Never to be the same person again. All my life I lived for me. I lived for myself, for parties, and all I did was sin, 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 and more sin. I later came to realize that God's Holy Spirit was guiding me even though I never knew Him. I was full of the devil. Now, let me tell you what happened on January 27th, 1997, that sent me to hell. I was living in Columbus, Ohio. My job was building fire trucks for the Sutphin Fire Equipment Corporation in Dublin. It had, uh, I had been working there for about four years at the time. It was on Friday, about 2.30 in the afternoon. We were putting doors uh, of fire trucks together, punching out the holes on the doors. We would uh, do about 60 at a time, which would be about three or four trucks worth. Gil, a fellow employee and friend of mine, was picking up the doors and putting them into the punch machine. I would hold them on top and line each one up on the press and let go. He would push a button with his foot and the machine would punch out the hole in each door. 
The day was a typical cold winter day and a pile of metal was brought in from the outside of the plant with snow all over it and of course the snow had melted which left us standing at a pool of water. We weren't worried about it otherwise it would have left and not worked until the water dried up. I would put my left hand on the stack of metal which was located on the left side of my body and then take my left hand off the metal and then put my right hand on the machine to turn a wheel that would punch a hole in the metal for the door locks. I would go back and forth like this all the while thinking that the machine was grounded, which it wasn't, we found out later. This was happening in the afternoon while others in the plant were also busy doing the jobs they were assigned to. Sometimes the others would have their backs to me and this is the way the accident happened when Gil had walked away. I touched the stack of metal with my left hand and touched the machine with my right hand at the same time, which caused me to become the ground of the electricity, completing the circuit. Electricity shot through me and it picked my feet right up off the ground, contracting the muscles in my legs and bending them backwards. I knew right away that I was getting electrocuted yet I was still able to look out into the shop from the platform that I was on and I could see everything going on as normal. No one knew that I was being electrocuted. While I was getting electrocuted crucifixion style, the electricity was flowing right through me and shortly thereafter I saw my spirit leave my body. Instantly I was in hell. At that time, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I wasn't a religious person or a Christian and didn't know any Christians. I just uh, know that I was cast into outer black darkness. I heard the most, I heard the most horrifying, tormenting screams imaginable. I heard these time and time again. And although I never saw who was screaming, I myself would scream because of the fear of those frightening screams and what was about to happen next. My sins began tormenting me while I was in that horrible place. I saw my sins pass from my right to my left like on some sort of a movie screen viewing them all the way back to the age of five. As I viewed each sin, it would make me scream out in torment. Now, here I was, a 27-year-old at the time, while this was happening, seeing all of my sins pass before me in living color, screaming in torment by every sin I saw. I saw my first sin committed at the age of five. It was a sin of disobedience, not honoring my mother and my father. My mother had said, I don't want you boys to eat those marshmallows. We, were, uh, we are going to have a roast. We are going to roast them over the fire in the backyard with a family tonight. My mother caught my brother Cliff and I hiding behind a stump in our backyard in Farmington, Michigan, eating those marshmallows. This wasn't a sin of murder or rape or whatever the world considers a horrible sin, but a simple sin of disobedience. It was the last of a long line of sins shown to me. I saw sin after sin after sin. For every sin I screamed torment. The pain of that torment cannot be expressed in human words. People have asked me, how long were you there? Well, it felt like eternity. It seemed that long. I couldn't tell you how long I was there, but I know this much. I don't ever want to go back there again. 
besides the screaming of other people in torment, there were also demons. Yes, there really are demons. I could see their grotesque faces. They came up to me and taunted me with indescribable horror and fear, yelling in my face with such intense volume, things like, We've got you now! laughing and sneering at me, saying, We fooled you! We've got you now! followed by hideous evil laughter. While this was happening, I began to realize I had been spiritually blinded, deceived my whole life about the actual reality of there being evil spirits deceiving us without even our realization. Demons working under Satan's commands. But worse yet, there being a literal hell where people suffer torment for their sins because they didn't accept the pardon God gives us through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ taking the punishment for our sins when he died on the cross so we can be forgiven for them and not have to suffer for them once we die like I was experiencing at that moment. Worse yet, while I was there, I had the great realization there was no hope, no hope, of ever seeing God, but rather suffering for my sins for all eternity. No hopelessness in this life compares to the hopelessness I was experiencing at that moment. But yet, even in my hopeless state, I somehow managed to cry out to God during this time, pleading, Oh, God, help me. Oh, God, help me. Now, here is what is both stunning and amazing. On my last scream, pleading for God to help me, I felt God's hand reach down and touch my shoulder. He's everywhere. You can read it in the Bible. He's in heaven, he's on earth, and even in hell, if he wants to be. And I'm sure glad, beyond what words can describe, that he wanted to be there at that moment for me. <laughs> he heard my plea. The right hand of the Lord touched me. I felt his fingers and thumb on my shoulder, and he pulled me out of hell. He said, me free from not only from the torments of hell, but that electricity as well. One of my fellow workers, Joe, who was, in, who was the safety foreman in the shop, was about 150 feet from me at the other end of the shop. He had heard my scream, but he didn't know who had screamed, but he did uh, no, I'm sorry, he had heard my scream, but he didn't know who had screamed, nor did he hear the words, I screamed, God help me. Immediately he started asking people, who was it that screamed like that? And they exclaimed, Tim. Then he quickly walked over and asked me, why did you scream like that? I told him, Joe, that machine bit me, electrocuted me. Joe exclaimed, Tim, that was the most horrifying scream I have ever heard in my whole life. It was just like a scream out of hell. See, in parentheses here, Tim writes, see, he didn't hear me crying out, God help me, when I was actually in hell being tormented by my sins being played back to me while the demons were taunting me and I was hearing the torments of other people screaming, Joe had just heard my frightening scream of being electrocuted. While I was in the tormenting outer darkness of hell, the moment God touched my left shoulder with his right hand, I saw my spirit instantly go back into my body and I came back alive. Thank God for him touching me. I was set free from the electricity, though I was instantly propelled about 12 to 15 feet from where I had been electrocuted. 
uh, doing two somersaults before ending up on the ground. My left knee hit the corner of a two-wheel cart and made the, the uh, tire spin and propel the cart up in the air as if a ghost had taken a ride on it. Shortly after being electrocuted, the numbness wore off and a great pain set in throughout my body. I was taken to the hospital admitted for three days. While in the hospital, three times a day, my cardiologist would come in and take an EKG. I would watch his eyes as he could not believe what he was reading. Back and forth, he would run his fingers over the EKG printout. I had learned to read a person's eyes while teaching scuba diving lessons uh, to determine how much fear they were dealing with. And his eyes told me of his deep concern as to my EKG. Excuse me here. So turn the pages. Uh, I'll, learn, I'll start that over. I, I learned to read a person's eyes while teaching scuba diving lessons to determine how much fear they were dealing with. And his eyes told me of his deep concern as to my EKG. Still didn't turn the right page, and my heart's condition. My doctor expressed his concern for me by asking me, Tim, do you feel okay? I looked at him and I said, I think so. Yet we both were scared. But I was scared a whole lot more than he was because I had experienced a part of hell and feared having to go back there if I died and all he was scared about was losing a patient. That's not funny, but later on in the hospital, my cardiologist said to me, Tim, I'm not a Christian. Do you know any? No, I said, I don't know any personally. About the only people I hang around are my uh, drug friends. Why? He responded, I have some Christian friends, and I believe that if I told them about you being electrocuted, they would agree you would be dead. I also believe they would say you're a living miracle. As I do also believe that, and that God would must have a plan for your life to let you come back to life. He went on to say, Tim, I understand electricity. The hospital uses electricity to bring back someone whose heart has stopped beating. But Tim, when you got electrocuted, crucifixion style, through your arms and through your heart, you should be dead instead of being brought back to life. I mean, honestly, I don't know why you're alive. And to think you were standing in water, that makes it ten times as bad, or ten times worse. Looking at the doctor, I thought to myself, Doc, if you only knew where I went when my spirit left my body, you wouldn't believe that either. Upon my release from the hospital, my cardiologist told me that it's natural to have some heart irregularities, but in time they most likely would subside and I should be fine. However, that wasn't the case. I kept having frequent strokes and I had to start going to my cardiologist's office, office because I was having two to three strokes every week. He soon realized I was uh, still such a high-risk stroke patient that he told his office secretary, uh, whenever Tim LaFon comes into this office, I want to see him right away, right away no matter whether I'm with another patient or not. He's that critical. Here I had the top cardiologist in the state of Ohio, one of the most highly rated neurologists as a brain doctor, and a top back specialist, which should have comforted me somewhat by most earthly standards, but inside of me I was empty. I had a great void in my life, plus I was living in fear, the fear of dying again and going back to hell. I returned two weeks later, and while at work, I'm sorry, I returned to work two weeks later, and while at work, I realized quickly that I could not remember the kind of work I did. My co-worker Gil found me in a corner weeping and asked me, Tim, what's the matter? 
I said to him, I know I work here, Gil, but I can't remember what I do. And he said, maybe we should go talk to the boss. My boss told me to go home and see a neurologist, which I did. My neurologist told me that most people do lose their short-term memory when they are electrocuted, at least to the degree that I was. She told me I probably lost about 30 million brain cells. Uh, she scared the living daylights out of me because I didn't know how many brain cells I had left, <laughs> but told me not to worry because my brain cells would grow back in time. Memory loss wasn't my only problem. My back also started to hurt with unbelievable pain when I would stand up. My wife would leave for work and come home and ask, What did you do today, honey? I answered, I got up and locked the door after you left for work and moments thereafter fell to the floor because of my intense back pain. I laid on the floor for nine hours in intense pain, crying until about 15 minutes ago. I just couldn't get up because the back pain was so bad. Time and time again, as the days followed, that would happen. Even though my back specialist told me that they had done all the tests they knew to do and couldn't find anything wrong with my back. Interestingly, I still had a lot of electricity in me for four to five months after the electrocution. I found that out the first time I kissed my wife. We uh, would shock each other when we touched. And it hurt. Now can you imagine every time you reach for your wife, you were shocked again. We, <laughs> we got so we would touch each other's hands first at the same time to lessen the shock before kissing. It really wasn't as funny as it might sound. The electricity that came into me didn't come out of me completely at the shop. My doctor said, Tim, the electricity could have blown your feet off, could have blown your hands or even your arms off, or even blown off the top of your head. Could have done any number of different things, but for whatever reason, you lucked out, though it didn't completely leave your body yet. I was having all these strokes that hurt so bad it made me curl up into a fetal position. This is why the doctor would see me whenever I was having these strokes. Of course, he couldn't do anything to help me. All the while this was going on, an aching void was intensif intensifying deep inside me. I knew in my heart who saved me. I saw where I was headed. Hell. I saw eternity and met death, and I didn't want to meet it again. Not that way. God had touched me, but now I had no idea how to find him. I didn't know then, but I found out later this scripture in Jeremiah 29, 13, that says, And you shall seek me and find me when you shall seek for me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. I would go out with my party friends and tell them that I wanted to find God. We would laugh about it, but I was serious. They would tell me to have another beer or smoke another joint. I started asking my friends if I was going crazy because I really wanted to find God. The only way they knew how to help me was to encourage me to get higher and forget it. They just didn't understand, yet I was saying, I want to find God. I want to find God. You'd have thought I was really going crazy. I kept crying, I want to find God. I hadn't found any help from my doctors or old friends. Just encouraging words that I was all right, that my memory would come back and that my strokes would subside, that my heart was healthy. They only knew the physical heart. My friends only knew the old Tim. I wanted to find God. I was a sinner who had died and gone to hell and had experienced the beginning of torments because of my sins against God. I was a lost sinner without God because I had not yet repented of my sins 
against him and others. I had not yet asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness for my sins. You see, my heart's desire is that you take... Now, Tim has written this here as a, uh, a parenthetical uh, insert here, and we'll read it. My heart's desire is that you will take heed to what you are reading, because this applies to every person still alive. I am convinced the only reason God spared me from staying in hell is to share my experience so no one else will have to go there if they'll let Jesus Christ be their Savior and Lord. And if he isn't, my friend, I would not put it off another moment. All it takes is asking him to be your Lord and Savior, asking Him to forgive you of all your sins, asking Him to lead you in what you're to do next. And do that every day the rest of your life. His Spirit will be granted to you, and His Spirit will begin to move in your life like you can't imagine. God will become so real to you if you're serious about meaning business with his lordship. Back to Tim's story. I moved to liberal Kansas and went to school to become a heavy diesel mechanic. I was also working in the oil fields and in a shop learning all the basics to become a mechanic. One day in November, I heard, uh, read an article about Anita Bryant coming to town with Cecil Todd as the evangelist. I arranged for all my new friends and my wife and I to go see her and hear her sing and minister. I didn't know what a Christian crusade was. I didn't know about all the beautiful music and songs that she was going to be singing. I never heard Anita sing before. Uh, at the time she was in the orange juice commercials and this night she sang Blessed Assurance. I had never heard that before and it was so beautiful. She also sang Victory in Jesus and How Great Thou Art. My heart was stirred. The songs were speaking to me, just as they do now when I hear them. She sang eight or ten more songs, but I only remember those three. Then Cecil Todd got up and gave the message. I couldn't really tell you what he said, something about salvation that Jesus saves. When he gave the altar call and invited people to come forward to acknowledge that Jesus, they wanted Jesus to be Savior and Lord of their life, he told everyone who wanted to accept Jesus into their life to come forward, and I was the first one to get up. <laughs> All I remember is that there were, all I remember is that here was God and I'd, that I'd been searching for. I'd wanted to find him for the last ten months. Finally, going to a crusade out of the blue, God led me to him. I literally ran down those gymnasium uh, steep stairs. Uh, I was told later from my friends that I ran so fast down the stairs they were worried I might trip. They even called out, don't let him fall. I was on the second row from the top. Looked like angels were carrying me. I flew that fast. Kneeling down, I asked God to forgive me of my sins. Praise the Lord, he did. At that moment, I became spiritually born again. Saved from the penalty of my sins. Pardoned for them. So I wouldn't have to go back to hell and pay for them for eternity. And that is the core of Christianity right there. Once again I got home. I grabbed the Bible and started reading it in the book of John in the New Testament. I remember these words in John chapter 1 starting right verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
Tim encourages everybody to read that if they've never read that. Read the whole chapter. Because once you get to chapter, well, about verse 14, I had to have to look at that, it tells you that the Word became flesh or a mere man and dwelt among us. So the implication there is that uh, Jesus Christ uh, was called the Word along with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. He was for all time and all eternity. And uh, he came down and followed the Father's plan to come down and live this life as a man, not as God, but as a man filled with the Holy Spirit uh, to do some miraculous and mighty things. And then was killed, hung on a cross, purposely allowed himself to hang on a cross and take the punishment for all of our sins so that they would be erased from God's memory and not held against us when we die. Well, anyway, I said, Oh God, I have been looking for you everywhere for 10 months, and here you are in this Bible. Yep, right there in the first chapter of the book of John. It tells us about Jesus Christ. The Lord was really speaking to me. I continuously read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Over and over again I read those books for four or for four or five to six years. I was so thirsty for his word and the very life-giving words of Jesus that are recorded in them. A lot of Christians have told me what a wonderful testimony I have. And I say, no, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, just like every other Christian who's reached out to let Jesus be Savior and Lord of their life. A lot of grace has been extended to me. Once I was lost, but now I am found. Don't any of you ever say that your testimony is not as good as mine. The grace of God has saved you. He's forgiven you. I'm no different. I just took a harder road to get there. And surely God said, this is a hard cookie. We're going to have to take him a different way before he softens up. What I found out by reading the Holy Scriptures, life has been much better than I could ever tell you. Much more glorious than I have ever dreamed possible. I never knew that giving my heart to the Lord would make such a difference. However, um, Satan has tried hard to take my life over and over again since this all happened. Because he does not want me sharing my testimony for God to use it. And here's some highlights of how Satan has tried to put Brother Tim out of commission. In 2006, I had a Quinn or a Quint bypass surgery. And in 2008, I almost died of a gallbladder that, di uh, that died and turned gangrene. And on June 4th through the 5th of 2010, I had two heart attacks and clinically died in the local hospital. I was brought back to life by my cardiologist using the heart panels. Praise God for electricity when you need it. Another precious song I love comes to mind. And I'm not going to try to sing this. He's a singer. I'm not. Victory is mine. Victory is mine. Victory today is mine. I told Satan, get thee behind. Victory today is mine. When I asked Jesus Christ into my heart, I found spiritual health, which is most important. And my memory increased when I found Jesus. It was even better than it was before. I was able to remember facts and figures and things. I started to memorize scripture. He helped me to remember. My chronic back pain also went away. 
In September of 1987, when I was at the uh, Nazarene Bible College, I was in prayer and God came. God gave me a vivid vision. He took me into another dimension and showed me the lake of fire as he held me above the lake of fire. This is speaking of hell for those of you who are not familiar with the Bible. There were millions of people burning in the lake of fire. Their bodies were whole, but they were burning. It was awful, horrifying, screaming people. It was a fearful thing to see. But I was at peace knowing that God had his hand on my shoulder. I don't know what to think about that. So I just kept it inside me and went to school the next day. After arriving home, I went again to the Lord in prayer at about 3.30 in the afternoon, and he came to me again, again in another vivid vision. This time he showed me the whole thing in greater detail and showed me the edge of the lake of fire. There were people falling over the edge. People were right on the brink of the fire. He said to me, quote, I'm going to use you to help tell the world that hell is real, and I'm going to save them and pull them back over the edge with your testimony and the truth of God's word. And uh, he gives Acts 4.12, John 3.17-18, through 18, Romans chapter 5, 8-11, through 11, uh, as some biblical references, keeping people from hell. Uh, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna save them, pull them more, back over the edge with your testimony and the truth of God's word before they go in, if they will reach out and ask Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior before they die. I want everyone to consider that no matter how great the struggles of life may be. There is an unseen guiding hand, the Holy Spirit, leading us to know the truth of heaven and hell before we die, if we truly want to know. That truth is found in the Bible. Hell is a place to avoid at all costs, and if we are wise, we must consider the reality of being without God because of our sins which means no hope either and cast into outer darkness upon dying and most likely ultimately ending up in the lake of fire. Please soberly consider, after having heard my testimony, the life you are presently living and ask yourself if you're ready for the judgment day. If not, then turn to God and repent of your sins and live for Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says that God the Father has delegated Jesus Christ to be the judge on Judgment Day. And you can read this testimony if you want. You can just go to any internet search engine and punch in uh, Tim LaFond testimony, L-A-F-O-N-D testimony. There's some scriptures here that's important that I want to also give before I get back to that Bible verse I started out with. Uh, in Matthew 8, 12, it reads in the King James translation. All of these will be out of the King James translation of the Bible. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty two thirteen. Jesus is doing the speaking in these uh, scripture passages, by the way. Matthew twenty two thirteen. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 30. 
And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20:14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 20.15 And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. People who have not made Jesus Christ their personal Lord and Savior, their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Is your name there, my friend? It can be as soon as you let Jesus be your Savior and Lord, ask him to be and mean business with him. Revelation 21.8 But the fearful, fearful of what? Fearful of what people might think of you if you become a sold out, born again Christian. But the fearful and the unbelieving, those that don't believe that Jesus Christ paid full penalty for all of our past, present, and future sins, and that if we will make him our Savior and Lord, those sins won't be held against us. And we get to go to heaven forever and have a party of joy never ending. Revelation 21.8, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, people worshiping anything other than making God their number one priority in life. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now, some Bible scholars believe that this outer darkness is a dimension of punishment for those who uh, have not made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior prior to dying. But a time will come that uh, it will be done away with and everybody in outer darkness will eventually be sent to um, the uh, lake of fire. Uh, that's based on Revelation 20, 14 and 2 Peter 2, 4. So it's not exactly for sure, but a lot of Bible scholars believe that be the case. Let's get back now to where we started. In Luke 15, verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. What does that mean? Well, it means it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal to us what it means and he wants those listening to me right now to know that most people don't believe they're a bad person they don't consider themselves to be sinners who need a savior in fact they don't feel like they need to be forgiven of anything repent for what see that's their attitude 
And for the one who says, yeah, if God says I'm a sinner and the Bible said all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, then I had better repent because I want to be in heaven with God for eternity. I want to experience life everlasting once this life is over. And so that's really what God is getting at. And I also want to say that there's sadness, I believe, in heaven as well over those 99 who felt like they didn't need repentance. I have to believe that though there's joy in heaven over one sinner who repents down here, the other 99, God hurts inside for those. He never created one person to end up in outer darkness and torment or to be sent to the lake of fire. God didn't create an angel. He didn't create a human being to do that. But sin entered into this world through Satan's rebellion, and we now are born with the sin nature of Adam and Eve passed down through the bloodline all the way to our moms and dads. And now we just sin. It is a um, common thing for us to do. No one has to teach us how to sin. Uh, disobedience to our parents comes real easy as it did to Tim at age five. Lying to our parents comes real easy. No one has to teach us. When we want what we want, learning how to lie is the easiest thing in the world. So we're all sinners. We could go on and on and on and on and on. But my friend, I just wanted to uh, let you know that time is running out. There is a heaven. God wants you to be there. He created you to be with him in heaven for eternity. you got to do something about that. You've got to appropriate what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He paid the penalty for all of your sins. He secured your pardon when he didn't have to. God himself in human form was likened into a lawyer in a courtroom and the judge says, guilty, lists off a whole bunch of sins. You are condemned to die. No, no life in prison, you're condemned to die. And your lawyer representing you says, hold it, your honor, hold it, hold it just a minute, time out. I want to die for my client. I'm willing to take the punishment that my client deserves and I want you to punish me so my client can go free and be free forever. That's what Jesus did for us, my friend. He was the lawyer who went to death, paid the penalty for our sins. Went to hell for three days and suffered when he didn't have to before he resurrected from the grave. He knows what suffering in hell is like. He went there for three earth days. I don't know how long that was, spirit days. So he paid the price. Be wise. Put him first in your life, my friend. Well, thanks for hearing me out. God bless you.